Today we're going to be taking a look at all of the sample nodes and operator nodes for what I have dubbed the Universal Geometry nodes. And at the end I've got an exciting announcement so be sure to stick around for that. For anyone who hasn't seen the first couple parts in this series, we're going to be taking a look at every node in Geometry nodes but not according to this built-in list, we're going to be going according to my own breakdown. So with all of that said, hi SLO everyone, I'm Gavin.js, let's hop into it. So to get started, let's take a look at the sample nodes. The sample nodes are great for finding data that isn't necessarily part of our original geometry. This means we can bring in additional geometry or branch our current geometry and modify it some to get the information that we need to get our desired output without necessarily including that geometry in our output. So to start off, we're going to take a look at the sample index node. I use the sample index node all of the time because it's an incredibly versatile node. Generally speaking, it's not always the best node for every situation where you need to sample some data, but it's very useful to try and figure out exactly what you need while you're still experimenting and trying to figure out how to get your desired output. What it does is retrieve your specified attributes on the specified index of the specified geometry. By default, it only looks at index 0, so if you want to look at all of your indices, you have to input the index node. And if you just want to look at a few specific indices, then you need to do some sort of operation on the index node or input some other value that will return the indices that you want. This node can also work on all domains, and it can sample multiple geometry types at the same time if you have multiple joined together. If that's the case, then it'll sample them in the order of mesh, point cloud, and then curves. And if you do have multiple components joined together and you only want to sample one component, then it's recommended that you use the separate components node to then sample just that component. Now that's fairly straightforward if you're sampling a different piece of geometry or if you're sampling the context geometry after it's been modified in some way, but if you're just sampling the context geometry as is, it's actually recommended to use the evaluate index node. This is because any node that has a geometry input is inherently going to be heavier to process than anything that doesn't. So if you're just inputting that index, it's a lot lighter. So if you know you're using the context geometry to sample, then use this node instead. We also have a clamp option, which clamps the indices to the size of the output attribute domain. This means that if we have more indices for our output attribute than we had for our input geometry, the remaining indices will have that attribute set to the default value. And in testing, this generally meant zero or whatever flavor of zero. So if we toggle this input, it'll then calculate that attribute for all of our indices. I really hope that made sense and I recommend you play around with it because it's not the most intuitive aspect of this node. Next we have the sample nearest node and geometry proximity node. These do essentially the same operation, but where they differ is in their output. What they do is take a given geometry and position and return information on the closest element in the given domain. Also, they only work on meshes and point clouds. The sample index node returns the index of the closest element, whereas the geometry proximity node returns the position of and distance to that closest element. And whenever you're sampling the context geometry, just like how it's better to use the evaluate index node instead of the sample index node, it's also better to use the index of nearest node instead of the sample nearest node. The index of nearest node is often used in conjunction with the sample index node or the evaluate index node because it requires a position in order to use it. And it comes with the ability to be even more precise when sampling your geometry because it has the group ID input. And if you do use the group ID input, then it'll give you this nice little boolean output of has a neighbor if there are at least two elements in the group that you're sampling. Then our last sampling node is the raycast node. This is a very common operation in games and is probably used the most often for physics, but there are tons of applications. Now that said, Raycasts are innately expensive, so just be cautious when using them. 
what this node does is casts a ray from one geometry to another, and the source of the ray is defined by the context the node is in. In order to use this node, we need a target geometry, which is the geometry to probe and test against. We need the source position, which is where our ray will originate from, and we need the ray direction and ray length. From this information, this node will return a boolean telling us whether or not the ray intersected with our target geometry, what position it intersected at, the normal at the intersection, and the distance from the origin of our ray to the intersection position. Now we also have an attribute input, but that's an optional input because most of the time we're more interested in whether or not our ray hit our target, and if so, what our other output values are. But of course, if we do input an attribute, it'll return that attribute from our target geometry at the position it hit. And we have two options for how that attribute is mapped. There's interpolated mapping, which means that we use a bilinear function to estimate the value of our attribute at the intersection position using the verts around that position. And there's the nearest interpolation, which reads out the value of the closest vert to the intersection point. Okay, for clarity, let's try that again in plain English. So, wherever we hit our target geometry, we're going to look at that face, and of the four verts, or however many verts that make up that face, we're going to interpolate between the values of that attribute on each of those vertices, like what's going on here. Then for our nearest interpolation, instead of interpolating between the values of our verts, we're just going to take the value of the nearest vert. So it'll return whatever the value is at the nearest point to our hit position. Now we can finally talk about operation nodes, which are probably what most people think of when they think about geometry nodes because they're the most visually evident in what they do. And probably the most basic of the operation nodes is the transform geometry node. Now that's not because it isn't complicated in its own right, it's because it's the most intuitive of the operation nodes. It allows us to translate, rotate, and scale our geometry. And while translation and scaling are fairly straightforward and very intuitive, rotation has one big caveat. You see, it allows us to type in degrees into the three parameters of our vector here, but if we input a vector for our rotation, instead of using degrees, it defaults to using radians. Now that's really not that big of a deal, but if you're not aware of this, it can be really confusing as to why when you, you know, modify these different values, it acts in one way, and then when you just input a vector node, it behaves in a totally different way with the same values. And this isn't just true for this node, it's true for any node that takes a rotation. So I like to make sure that I'm always working with pi and just inputting a vector instead of typing in degrees. That way I'm always using the same logic. One more note on the transform geometry node. It always does all three transformations. So if you know you only want to translate your geometry over by a little bit, but you don't want to scale or rotate it, I would recommend using the set position node instead. And there are a few other nodes that you can use to do the various operations, but try and lean into using those over the transform geometry node. But if you're not terribly worried about performance and you don't want to worry about optimizing, go for it. Absolutely use this node. It's much easier to intuit than some of the other options. Next, we have the delete geometry node. And this node deletes the selected geometry based on the domain you have selected and the mode you've set. What happens is based on that mode, it'll delete the selected geometry under the domain you've set, but it may also delete other geometry under different domains. We have three different modes. We have all, which is going to take whatever domain we've selected. Here I'm going to just say the points domain. And any geometry that's associated with any of the points that we've selected will also be deleted, even though it's under, say, the edges or face domain. That's why we have the other two modes, so that instead of deleting, say, again, the points domain, even though we have points selected, if we set it to delete faces and edges, it'll only delete the faces and edges, but leave the points behind. 
The same thing when it's set to faces, it'll delete the faces but leave the edges and points. Again, even though we've got the points domain selected. Now I know that may not sound the most intuitive, but I promise there are lots of reasons for why we would have these different options and why we would want different combinations of domain and mode. It gives us lots of control as to what geometry we are going to delete and what geometry we're going to keep. So I encourage you to play around with it and go through all of the different permutations because if I were to outline all of them, we'd be here for way too long. And I can't even promise that I'll explain it in a very coherent manner. So instead, we'll move on to the separate geometry node. What this node does is separate our geometry based on our selection into two different geometries, which is why we've got these two different geometry outputs, our selected geometry and our inverted geometry. The selected geometry is of course the geometry that is in our selection, and the inverted geometry is the geometry that's not in our selection. If we have multiple components mixed together in our geometry, then any geometry that doesn't get run over for our separate geometry node will be included in both outputs. Next we have the duplicate geometry node, and this node duplicates our geometry the specified number of times. Also, this node only duplicates the given domain. So if we set it to duplicate our points, only the points will be duplicated. We won't have any edges or faces. Also, when we duplicate faces, we get only faces. So really, it creates new edges and points. So you'll get a lot more edges and points than what you started with because they're all going to be separate faces. Also, when we duplicate instances, we're only going to be duplicating top-level instances. Next, we have the Merge by Distance node, which behaves just like the operation in Edit mode, Merge by Distance. Something that's really important to note, though, we do have this selection input, meaning that anything that's in that selection will be the only points that are merged together. And this is really useful because this can be an expensive operation if we're going through every point in our geometry and merging all of them together. It can get really expensive, so if you know which points you want to merge together, I highly recommend using the selection to save yourself some processing time. The bounding box node returns the minimum and maximum vectors that are used to define our input geometry. It then uses those vectors to construct a box that perfectly contains that geometry. Also, just real quick, as with many of these nodes, instances have an exception. So instead of putting a bounding box around all of our instances, what it does is creates a bounding box for each instance. The convex hull node is, in my mind, fairly similar to the bounding box node in that it creates geometry that perfectly surrounds our input geometry. But instead of creating this bounding box made up of the, you know, minimum and maximum vectors, what it does is it creates geometry that perfectly wraps around without any concavity. Sort of like the shrink wrap modifier. Also, if you have any attributes on your input geometry, those won't be transferred to your resulting geometry. Then our last operator node is the separate components node. If we have multiple different types of geometry all together in our input geometry, then what this node does is takes each type of geometry or component and separates them out into those constituent components. And of course, because we can separate our components, that implies that we can join our components. And that's exactly what the join geometry node does. Now, the join geometry node and the geometry to instance nodes don't exactly fit into the operations category, so I've lumped them into this other category. Uh, but we're going to talk about them regardless. So, the join geometry node does exactly what it says it does. It joins any number of geometry together into one geometry. We can use this to run all of our geometry through the same operation, or just to view different geometries together in the viewport. The one exception here is volumes. You can't use the join geometry node to join multiple volumes together. Also something to note, if you have multiple meshes that don't all have the same materials, all of your material slots will be combined together so that all of the materials you have will be listed in the output geometry. 
And our last node is the geometry to instances node. All it does is converts your geometry to instances. It doesn't really join all of those instances together. They're still individual instances, but it makes it so that you can do all of the things you can do with instances on any given geometry. And that's it. Now we've discussed all of the geometry nodes in geometry nodes. By which, of course, I mean the universal geometry nodes. Next time, we'll be talking about meshes and all of the nodes associated specifically with meshes. So thank you all for watching. I really do appreciate it. And that big exciting announcement is I've started a Patreon where you can go and check out some additional resources that I have available there, some of which are free. I've uploaded my breakdown and categorization of all of the nodes, and I'll also be keeping a free blog there where I'll be updating everyone on my general workflow, timelines, what projects are going to happen when. We'll see what all happens there. Also, if you choose to support me, there you'll get access to additional files there's not really a ton right now but i'm working on giving you access to different project files maybe my annotated notes on all of the nodes so head over there to check that out i really do appreciate it if you choose to support me anyway thank you all so much again for watching i really appreciate it i hope you've learned something and i'll see you in the next one bye